Good Saturday morning. We have made it to nine o'clock. It is April 13th and we are really glad that you're hanging out with myself, Erica, and one of the dynamic duo of the Sarahs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Half of the Sarahs. Half yes. of the Sarahs. Yes. So Sarah Cuss is enjoying a little vacation right now, but I'm so happy that you guys are joining mm. us, Erica and RJ. It's the coffee has kicked morning. in. We've been having fun. We've been having fun. We've been talking about Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Ooh. If you know, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, this week is going to be a pretty nice weekend. Now take a look at the pollen count today. This is good news. Oak is moderate for the first time in a while. It was high for a long time, so it's down to moderate levels. Molds and pecan are low as well. And here's a look at oak season. Oak season usually peaks around the first of April. We're heading toward the end here of oak season by May, and uh, especially by mid-May, oak should be out of here completely. Temperatures this morning, mild, 65 in San Antonio, 63 in Kerrville. Good morning, Hondo, 65 degrees, 65 at Stinson, 66 in Converse, and 64 in Yavaldi. We do have some areas of fog still for New Braunfels and San Marcos, but visibility starting to lift as we're seeing those winds pick up. And that's going to be the main story today is that it's going to be a little on the breezy side. We'll have a few gusts of up to 30 miles per hour. Humid again tomorrow, though, we are going to be looking at fairly stubborn cloud cover and a high temperature in the mid 80s tomorrow as well. In the week ahead, some slim rain chances and it's going to be pretty warm. Those details in a few. Erica. Thank you, Sarah. Well, two people are fighting for their lives this morning after a meetup to sell a gun ended in a shooting in Bernie. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar says five people in separate vehicles met up on the 8700 block of Star Ranch to sell a gun. At some point, shots rang out and a chase between the two groups began. That's when a suspect in one vehicle pulled up to the other vehicle and allegedly shot the driver in the head and the passenger in the legs. Both were taken to the hospital. That driver is in critical condition. This is an ongoing investigation. Second arrest has been made in a botched shoe sale that ended in a deadly shooting. Check out 17 year old Diego Salazar. He was arrested by BCSO deputies on a warrant for murder. He's believed to have been the driver for the first for the first suspect, excuse me, who was arrested last Saturday, and that would be 18 year old Daniel Hernandez. We've caught him here walking in front of our cameras after he was arrested. The sheriff's office says that Hernandez went to his friend, 18 year old Ricky de los Santos house to buy shoes and ended up shooting him. BCSO says De Los Santos was able to give them Hernandez's name as he was dying. In your morning Texas headlines, police are investigating after a student at a high school in Dallas was shot yesterday. Police responded to Wilmer Hutchins High School in southeast Dallas on an active shooter call. One student was shot in the leg and is expected to be okay. They took one person into custody. No other students were injured and parents were able to pick up their kids up after the incident. At least one person is dead and 13 others are hurt after the driver of a semi trailer intentionally crashed into a DPS office right outside of Houston. This happened in the town of Brenham. According to police, 42 year old Clinard Parker allegedly crashed into the building where his renewal for a commercial driver's license was rejected. Right now, authorities are not saying what charges Parker will face. The Texas Rangers are handling this investigation. The liver and kidney transplant programs have been deactivated at Memorial Hermann Hospital out of Houston after a surgeon there was accused of denying some of his patients liver transplants. That's according to our sister station KPRC. A federal investigation is now underway for the allegations that Dr. Steve Bynan was secretly altering transplant databases with the intention of making some of his patients ineligible for liver transplants. Dr. Bynan has led Memorial Hermann's abdominal transplant program since 2011. FEMA has announced nearly $18 million is earmarked to come directly to San Antonio to support the city's migrant response. <laughs> Those funds will be distributed among five different entities. That includes the city itself, the city of San Antonio, the Food Bank, the Interfaith Coalition, the Episcopal Diocese of West Texas, and Catholic Charities. Local congressional leaders say San Antonio's Migrant Research Center will be able to benefit from FEMA's grant. This news comes just in time in recent in months, city leaders have been discussing ways to come up with different options here for funding for the center's operations. 
Happening this weekend, another round of traffic closures. TxDOT has closed parts of I-10 at Loop 1604. This will impact your commute on the northwest side of town all weekend. It's all part of the Loop 1604 North Expansion Project. The closures are set to be lifted on Monday at 5 a.m. For a full list of closures and detours, just head to KSAT.com. All right, happening today from 9 a.m., already underway here, 5 o'clock, the 12th Annual San Antonio Book Festival, as we've been sharing with you all morning. Over 100 authors attending, and it's an exciting time to get out there and enjoy learning and hearing about all the new books that are out right now. Yeah, our photographer Alexis is out there. Let's check back in with her, and here's a look there. They have the tent set up, RJ. Mm -hmm. Everybody is getting ready. You see some people already walking around. Again, more than 100 authors that's incredible yeah and this is a family fun event this is all free and again authors from all over the country and the lone star state will be speaking about their books at different times and of course can't go wrong here we're gonna have food trucks vendors and a play area for kids we will be checking in at the event throughout the newscast newscast so stay with us all right yeah a lot of different things going on right now so hopefully you guys are doing off to a good start this saturday 906 right now and uh, 65 degrees outside and we're going to take a quick shot here of some of our trans guy cameras. Look at that, Erica. 1604 at Hebner right now. Major back. You can see, yeah, you can see it on the side there of people just, yeah, it's just slow going. Have patience. Well. It's yeah. it's <laughs> going to be there for a bit. Yeah, again, 1604 westbound. That's shut down. And then also 1604 at I-10. It looked live with live cam. A great shot there of those highways there it is a beautiful morning look at that it's yeah. great clear blue skies we'll have more with sarah after the break all right welcome back coming up on 9 10 good morning san antonio and happening today nine o'clock to 5 p.m the 12th annual san antonio book festival and of course we have our crews out there right now now we have been telling you about some of the authors attending today and about their books we got to speak with local author christopher rooster martinez a san antonio native and a poet of 13 years he says poetry and writing has always been a part of his life and his passion for it took off during his college years martinez currently teaches english and creative writing at Palo Alto College. Very cool stuff there. His book, Mexican Dinosaur, you see it right there on the screen, is filled with his poems about his life experiences, family history on the west side of San Antonio, the myths and history around Chicanismo and grief. Representing San Antonio all over Texas, performing his poetry at Poetry Slams across the nation, Martinez says Mexican Dinosaur captures his love for our city. This book is, is in many ways a love letter to the city and also just my uh, appreciation for for everything that it's bestowed upon me uh, from my family to 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 love to loss to everything. So uh, that's really what propelled me to put it together. All right, love to see that him thriving out there. He also mentions the San Antonio Book Festival is a chance for everyone to reconnect with reading and writing. You can meet him today at the Central Library at UTSA, their Southwest Campus, where he will be speaking around noon. For more information, visit the KSAT community page on KSAT.com. Right now on KSAT.com, we have an article about some of the authors attending this year's San Antonio Book Festival. You can view the stories. We've shared about them and their new books. Just head to KSAT.com and look for this article in our KSAT community tab. It is such a great event. The weather is great to go yeah. out there, Sarah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get any better than that. It really doesn't. And we were talking about it a little bit earlier in the show, but books that shaped uh, our youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were they for you guys? Of course, like Cat in the Hat, Amelia Bedelia, yeah. Charlotte's Web. Uh -huh. Those were like the books that now I'm now reading to my daughter. Mm -hmm. oh, that's awesome. You give a mouse a cookie. And then I also liked uh, later on in high school, The Old Man in the Sea. That was a good one. I really Great. enjoyed that one. So yeah, just a different mix of. <laughs> and you were all books. about Harry Potter. Yes. I was all about <laughs> Harry Potter, but I remember really loving the Bronte sisters mm, and like Wuthering okay. Heights and things yeah. like that, you know, old English romantic Take stuff. That. <laughs> <laughs> Although Wuthering Heights is a pretty dark book for us to be reading. Yeah, in high absolutely. School, for sure. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. It is hummingbird season, guys. The hummingbirds are back. Uh, and so get out your sugar water. 
and put it out there. Those hummingbirds will appreciate it. Thank you, Peggy, for sending in this picture. You can post your spring pictures to KSAC Connect on our weather app and on KSAC Connect on our web page. Outside right now, just some wispy cirrus clouds there off in the distance. It is a pretty mild and cool morning. It's 65 at the airport, 67 at Port SA, 65 in New Braunfels. Good morning, comfort. It's 62 degrees, 65 in Hondo and 67 in Pleasanton. We're starting to see visibility improve in New Braunfels. Earlier visibility was as low as half a mile, but the fog is starting to lift in New Braunfels. Visibility down to two miles. The biggest impact to your day is going to be the winds. Winds are going to be gusting up to 25 to 30 miles per hour throughout the day, especially across the hill country. That's where we'll have even windier conditions, you know, with a lot of valleys out there channeling the wind. So keep that in mind if you live up in the hill country. Otherwise, in San Antonio, again, a few gusts of up to 25 to 30 miles per hour possible during the day. And then again tonight, too. So tonight is going to be pretty breezy. Now, those winds will be from the south, and so those winds are slowly going to be increasing our humidity. Today, you won't necessarily notice too much humidity out there. It's still going to be pretty pleasant in the afternoon, but definitely by tomorrow and definitely by Monday, you will notice how humid it's going to be outside. In fact, by Monday, we'll have some areas of drizzle. But looking at your KSAT 12 hour forecast for the day today around noon 74. Notice those winds sustained from the south at 15 miles per hour. Afternoon high temperature of 84 degrees, so on the warmer side. And then tonight, Saturday night plans, don't take the jacket with you. You will not need it. Temperatures are still going to be in the 70s by 10 o'clock. And then again, it is going to be a little on the breezy side. As far as highs go today, again, 84 in San Antonio, about four degrees warmer than seasonably average in San Antonio, but even hotter out to the west. It's going to be 90 in Del Rio, 91 in Laredo, low 80s in the Hill Country, 82 in Kerrville and in Comfort, 84 in Nixon, Smiley, Poteet, Strawberry Festival, 85 degrees for the high today. Quiet across the Central Plains. There's a big low pressure system bringing some snowfall to parts of New York, but a ridge of high pressure overhead. This is keeping us dry and making it warm across the Central Plains. In fact, it's going to be warmer in parts of Nebraska than it is in San Antonio today. And temperatures there are going to be some 25 degrees above average, all because of that high. Now that high is going to scooch off to the east, but we're going to stay warm in San Antonio. High temperatures near 90 degrees Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Only a very small chance for rain with morning drizzle on Monday and then a 20% chance for for a few showers on Tuesday, so very low rain chances. But I know you can see it on your screen. Big temperature drop from Thursday into Friday by some 20 degrees or so. It could even potentially be cooler than that for the first weekend of Fiesta. Mm -hmm. I'll give you those quick details coming up here in just a bit. So it'll be nice when you go out to Oyster Bay, taste of New Orleans. That weather's just going to be perfect. A little bit cooler, probably. Yeah, good stuff there. Okay, Sarah, thank you very much. 915 right now, 65 degrees outside. A church on the northwest side is closing what the pastor says about why after the break. And we're going to head to break. Quick check here of the lottery numbers. You see pick three, daily four, cash five. And let's go ahead and advance to the next one here real quick. And those are your Mega Millions numbers. Good luck to everyone who played. Welcome back. It's 919 on your Saturday morning. And after 78 years of ministry, the Jefferson Community Church has unfortunately closed. The pastor says that her congregation fell behind on bills, including rent. She spoke to our John Paul Barajas about what the church meant to the Northwest side. Make me very proud that we have such deep roots in the community. It's a long trip down memory lane to 1946, the year the church once known as Jefferson Methodist first opened its doors. It's going to leave a big hole. It's going to leave a big gap, and, and I'm filled with, with sadness for the, for the loss. Now, 78 years of service is coming to an end, leaving church members with only memories and friendships. The last service was on Easter Sunday, and it was a really beautiful service. Um, it was a really sad service because we all knew this was the last time we would gather in this building for worship. Pastor Olivia Down and Walker says the congregation got smaller over the years. The church brought in less money and fell behind on bills including rent to the United Methodist Church Conference. Jefferson disaffiliated from the UMC in 2019. They voted to disallow LGBTQ members of the church from serving as clergy or from serving as staff members or board members. 
and we just kind of felt like that was a huge step backwards in history, and we wanted to be in a church that was progressive. The courts ruled the United Methodist Conference owned the property. As Jefferson Community Church, the congregation would pay nearly $700 a month in rent and 25000 in compensation for leaving the Methodist Conference. We had enough from our tithes that we could you know, keep the doors open, but we didn't have enough that we could set aside to make that balloon payment. Jefferson was asked to vacate its building at the beginning of March. Its food pantry, weekly community dinner, and community closet will close as well. There are a lot of people that I don't see anywhere else except here. And uh, um, those are the people I will miss because we're all going to scatter. The only thing we know right now is that we want to stay as close to this neighborhood as we can. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. And we'll see what goes on with that community. Now, the Jefferson community will host a sale on its thrift store items and leftover furniture. That will be held today and tomorrow from 8 to 6 p.m. All funds will go toward funding, or excuse me, finding the church a new home. Yeah, definitely want to follow up with them. Okay, 921 right now and 65 degrees outside. We're going to take a quick live look outside at the 12th annual San Antonio Book Festival there. People, there's a crowd going now. We've yeah. got people arriving. We'll have more on the book festival later in this newscast. If you have some stuff to get rid of today is your chance to do some spring cleaning. The City of San Antonio's Solid Waste Management Department is hosting a free landfill day for residents. You can get rid of household bulky items like appliances, furniture, and mattresses. Construction materials are not allowed, though. You can take it to a couple of different places. The Republic Service Landfill off I-10 East or the Waste Management Landfill on Coville Road. You'll have until 1 this afternoon to drop off your stuff. You'll need a picture ID and a recent CPS energy utility bill showing payment for the city's environmental fee. Also happening today and tomorrow, San Antonio Pets Alive is celebrating Fiesta with an adoption special. Look at that little guy there. How do you not want to adopt Aww. that little guy? The Fiesta hat. Fees for all dogs and puppies who are adopted from Pets Alive Rescue Center on Marbach Road this weekend will be waived. Right now, there are tons of animals looking for love and a new home. All animals adopted from Pets Alive are up to date on their vaccinations. They're spayed, neutered, and of course, microchipped. This is a special just for this weekend. I think Chloe needs a friend. <laughs> Go, RJ. <laughs> Those are just some of the several events going on this weekend. To see all that information or more details of the events I, we just mentioned, scan the QR code on your screen with your phone. It will take you directly to our Things to Do section of KSAT.com. And there are a lot of things to do for sure. 926 right now, 66 degrees. Here is another look at the San Antonio Book Festival. The tents are up, people are arriving. There is a lot to do. Over 100 authors will be there today. We'll have more on the Book Festival after the break. It's 9.30 on this Saturday, April 13th. Thank you for joining with us. I'm yes, already losing my absolutely. words. It's been a long week. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us. Of course, it is a beautiful morning out there. I know your little girl just got a hit, right? Yeah, my mom just Erica's texted me. She's updates. playing softball right now. I'm getting yeah, updates. updates. We're winning. <laughs> Go Capital Park Tigers. <laughs> so obviously a lot of people are going to be paying attention to the weather. Sarah, how are things looking? Great. Mm -hmm. I have to say this, though. Erica, RJ, we're used mm -hmm. to seeing you guys on the weekdays. Glad you're joining us on the weekend as Sarah is on vacation. But you guys share something in common, right? Ooh. Texas State Bobcats. There we go, yes. Eat them up. Eat them up, Bobcats. <laughs> Even Alex, our producer. Yeah, she's right there. Wow. She's a Bobcat. I'm so outnumbered today. Sorry. Aggie, three three Bobcats. Three to one. Eat them oh up, cats. I could probably take on three Bobcats. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and take a look at temperatures out there. This afternoon, we're going to be at 84 degrees. It's going to be warm over the next several days. A lot like a late spring day. In fact, we're going to be close to 90 degrees three days in a row, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But before it can get too warm, we get a front moving through uh, the day after Fiesta starts. In fact, we're going to be looking at highs plummeting some 20 degrees. It could be even cooler over the first weekend of Fiesta. So that's the next thing we're watching even beyond the, the next seven days. We're going to be seeing how cold is this air. There's still some questions on how cold exactly it would be outside, but I do expect a much cooler weekend next weekend. Temperatures even in the 50s and 60s possible. Speaking of the 60s, that's where we're at right now, but we still 
still got a lot of daytime to warm up. In fact, there are some clouds moving through Uvalde, Hondo, Carissa Springs. It's in the mid 60s, 65 degrees in San Antonio. Decent amount of sunshine here around the Alamo City at the moment. And as we look at the weather headlines, the big story today is that it's going to be pretty breezy. We're going to see a few wind gusts of up to 30 miles per hour. Tomorrow, the humidity returns. You'll really notice the humidity. In fact, drizzle possible on Monday morning and we have small chances for rain. I'll give you these details coming up in just a bit. RJ. Thank you very much, Sarah. While well, a woman is facing a life sentence in the death of her four year old stepson. Yesterday, the trial of Miranda Cáceres continued with testimony from the Bear County Medical Examiner who performed the autopsy on Benjamin Cervera. She backed up her statement that the little boy died of starvation. She said pepper seeds were the only thing in the boy's stomach. During the trial, Benjamin's brother said Cáceres would force Benjamin to eat hot sauce along with hand sanitizer and toilet water. And taken in with everything else, the medical records, the autopsy findings, um, the, the lack of, of disease processes, then yes, it fits um, together that this appears to be uh, a homicide. Well, if Gossetis is found guilty, she could face life in prison. Court records show that Benjamin's dad will stand trial next month. A former cheerleading coach is going to prison for the next five years. That sentence was handed down to Bazan this week. Lex Bazan was arrested in 2021 after a security guard at Lavernia High School caught him trespassing. He reportedly told the guard he was there visiting one of his cheerleaders that had been that team then told police he was there to give her the plan B pill because Bazan has sec was sexually assaulting her. Bazan ultimately accepted a plea deal, allowing him to plead guilty in exchange for just five years in prison. And a San Antonio police detective has been suspended for 15 days after multiple incidents of unprofessional behavior at the Bear County Justice Center. That's according to city discipline records obtained by case at 12. Detective Steven Rivas was involved in the incidents. Rivas will be suspended from May 4th to the 18th. And in your morning headlines, an urgent manhunt this morning for two people wanted for a deadly carjacking in broad daylight. ABC's M. Wen has the latest in what authorities are now saying. This morning, new video shows a brazen armed carjacking involving who authorities say is a South Florida woman at a traffic light stop. It is incredibly frightening to watch the boldness of this of this suspect. Cell phone video capturing the moment a hooded masked gunman points his firearm directly at the driver in front of this green Acura before then climbing into the car, a white Durango. And now an urgent manhunt is underway in Florida for at least two suspects in connection with this crime. The guy had a machine gun and got the guy to open the door and was pointing the gun at him and then he got in the back seat of the car. Authorities say they believe the woman held a gunpoint. 31-year-old Catherine Altagracia Guerrero de Aguas Villas was killed shortly after the incident. The Seminole County Sheriff said she had traveled up from Homestead, Florida earlier that day and stopped at a gas station for eight minutes before noticing the car was following her. There is no explanation why somebody would target her, why, why she would uh, be followed like that. Investigators say a body was then later found charred inside a burning vehicle believed to be that white Durango. It was located some 30 miles away from the carjacking in Osceola County, according to law enforcement. Investigators say the victim had called her husband just minutes before the kidnapping. Her husband told her not to stop the car, though neither called 911. Many questions still remain, including how the victim was said to be visiting family, but detectives never found any blood relatives in the area. And while a motive still remains unclear, one thing seems to be for sure. Investigators say they do not believe this was a random act. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. Well, in other news, we all know that San Antonio is Military City USA, and now it will be the host city for the 2024 Congressional Medal of Honor Society Convention that will happen later this year. That announcement was made yesterday at the historic Hangar 9 at Brooks. The Medal of Honor is the country's highest award for military valor in action right now. 66 Medal of Honor recipients are still living, and 45 of them are expected to be at that convention. That's awesome. I just want to say I am internally grateful uh, that we're having this here uh, and my love for San Antonio began 55 years ago when I trained to be a combat medic 
or Vietnam. And um, I have so many stories I could tell you about how compassionate and, and loving and kind this community was to me then. And, and I, I'm sure it's only gotten better since then. The convention will be held September 29th through October 5th. During their visit, the Medal of Honor Society will be making visits to our schools and military hospitals to share their patriotism. Well, we've seen the booths being set up, the vendors out there. The 12th annual San Antonio Book Festival is underway, happening now until 5 o'clock. Yeah, our photographer Alexis has been live out there this morning. Earlier, we heard from the festival's director, Lily Gonzalez, about what people could expect from today's event. And we also spoke to some people who are out there right now. Let's go ahead and take a listen. It's truly a festival that celebrates storytelling, I would say, but um, the festival is intended for you to come and like spend the day with us. So you can walk into a venue, you can hear an author speak either on a panel or by themselves, and then you can head over to the Nowhere Bookshop tent and buy the author's book, and then you can walk over and meet the author and get it signed. And then of course you have your usual festival fair, which is food trucks and exhibitors and vendors. All of that is happening here too. We're kind of like scoping it out so far because we, we got here a little bit early. So we're just kind of looking around. Um, I know I have a couple of authors that I want to see, especially um, Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Again, the event is until 5 p.m. You still have plenty of time to get out there and enjoy. There's a live look right now. What's going on out there? Oh yeah, definitely. More than 100 authors out there from not only Texas, but across the country. And I love their soundbite there. They were speaking about just wanting to see the specific authors. Obviously, these authors have a major influence on a lot of people with their books, their literature, poems, whatever it might be. And there's a genre for everybody. This is for the whole family. There's stuff for the kids. There's stuff for adults, for teens. It is a lot of fun. So it's one of the many events going on around town today, but this is a great one to go check out. Yeah, and it is all free. So thank you very much to Alexis out there giving us a live look at the 12th Annual San Antonio Book Festival. Okay, it is 9.38 right now, and look at that. We are ticking up to 70 degrees. We're at 67 right now. It's warming up after the break, Lunchables. It's something many of us probably have snacked on, and it's popular amongst children. I give them to my child all the time. One new test found that is not great news for those eating them. Uh oh. All right. So, yeah, you may be thinking about taking some snacks out today for whatever you're going to be doing Poteet Strawberry Festival, all sorts of things going on as we take a look at Live Cam. The city of San Antonio looking great on a Saturday. We're going to check in with Sarah, check in on that forecast. 9.42, welcome back. Well, Lunchables, did you have a favorite Lunchable growing up? Just the basic, you know, the ham, the cheese, mm -hmm. the cracker. Same with me, and your yeah. daughter. She loves the pizza ones. <laughs> yes. Well, they've been around for years as a quick and easy lunch or snack, and they're obviously popular with the kiddos, but a new Consumer Reports investigation may have parents thinking twice. Now I'm thinking twice. As 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz explains, tests turned up high levels of sodium and lead. In the rush to get out the door, Lunchables, prepackaged lunch kits are convenient, and many kids love them. But listen to this. Lunchables and similar kinds of lunch kits are simply not healthy for kids. We even have them in the office lunchroom. This one's turkey and cheese. Just what's inside? Let's pop it open. Here we have cheddar cheese, processed turkey, and a row of crackers. Consumer Reports took a closer look testing 12 store-bought lunch and snack kits and finding concerning levels of lead, cadmium, or both in all of them. Even in small amounts, the effects of these heavy metals are cumulative and they can contribute to developmental problems in children. Kraft Heinz, the parent company of Lunchables, Oscar Meyer, and P3, says all their foods meet strict safety standards and lead and cadmium occur naturally in the environment and may be present in low levels. Smithfield Foods, which makes Armour Lunchmakers, says it adheres to strict programs and policies that promote food safety and quality. Target, which makes Good and Gather, did not respond. Now the sodium. Levels range from 460 to 740 milligrams, nearly a quarter to half of a child's daily recommended limit. And versions found in some school lunch programs, those had even more sodium. Kids with high sodium intakes are about 40% more likely to develop hypertension than those with low sodium diets. Smithfield Foods said sodium is a key ingredient and helps meet customer demands for quality, authenticity, flavor, and convenience. Kraft Heinz and Maple Leaf Foods said they're working to reduce sodium. 
So what's a busy parent to do? Look over that school lunch menu to find nutritious things your kids like or brown bag it with healthy foods from home. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. I did love the pizza ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the pizza ones so much. <laughs> I know. And then for a while there, they were doing the dessert pizza ones when I was oh, a kid. Oh, there's a dessert pizza one? When I was a kid. Look, we're talking about unhealthy. That dessert, <laughs> yeah, there's always like a little one. chocolate. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, it was, instead of pizza sauce, it was chocolate sauce. <laughs> and instead of pepperonis, it was yeah. M&M's. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, do I, oh I hope Leon, I'm glad Liana's not watching because she'd be like, where are those? <laughs> they yeah. don't exist anymore, Liana. Mm. They don't exist <laughs> Maybe because all we were memories so with lunchables. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and get down to the weather and talk about the pollen count. In the pollen count, this is good news. Oak is down into moderate levels. It's been high for several days, even several weeks now, so that is good news. Moles are present and pecan is present, but in low amounts. Now, outside right now, totally sunny over the city of San Antonio. We are seeing some clouds, though, out there, so keep in mind it's going to be a partly cloudy day. It's 65 in Kerrville, 64 in Rock Springs, Del Rio, good morning at 68 degrees, 67 in Catula, already 71 in Pleasanton, 66 in New Braunfels. Temperatures are, are quite a bit warmer than that, how they have been the last few mornings. In fact, with our morning low near 60 degrees, that's about 15 degrees warmer than the last couple of mornings. As we look at our KSAT 12 hour forecast for the day today, around noon it's going to be 74, partly cloudy and 84 for the high temperature in San Antonio. And this evening, you're not going to want the jacket. It's still going to be in the 70s by 10 o'clock, so a pretty mild evening. It's going to be a nice day, but if there was one thing to get a little hung up on, it's the fact that it's going to be windy. Winds are going to be gusting up to 25 to 30 miles per hour throughout the day today. So if you have yard work planned, if you have any outdoor uh, outdoors time outdoors plan, know that it is going to be breezy, uh, and so you may want to take that into account. Those winds will be from the south, and so although dew points are relatively low right now in the 50s, with those winds from the south, we're really going to see the humidity steadily rise. You will notice the mugginess in the air tomorrow. In fact, we'll have stubborn morning clouds and even a bit of a heat index value during the peak heat of the day tomorrow. Keep that in mind. It is going to be humid, and we're going to see those stubborn morning clouds like I mentioned. Here's a look at the future cast. A few peaks of sunshine in the afternoon tomorrow. By Monday morning, it is going to be noticeably humid, so much so in the fact that it, we will have areas of patchy drizzle. RJ, our traffic guy, Monday morning, the drizzle is going to be out there, so uh -oh. keep that in mind. We could have some uh, bit of damp spots on the roads. By Tuesday, uh, in the mid-morning hours, a few isolated showers, only 20% chance for an isolated shower, but still the potential is there. Let's go ahead and walk through your forecast. Humid tomorrow, 85 for the high, drizzle on Monday morning, a little bit cooler on Monday because those clouds will be so stubborn. An isolated shower is possible on Tuesday. The Look how warm it's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Highs will be near 90 degrees, so a warm middle section of the week there. Then by Friday, a big drop in temperatures. This looks like a real deal cold front. Highs will be some 20 degrees cooler on Friday, and there's even the potential that it could be even cooler than that into the weekend. So Oyster Bake, mm -hmm. first full weekend of Fiesta, you may be wanting that jacket. We're going to be get able to continue to look at that forecast and refine that forecast as it's just outside of our seven day forecast, but it's something I want you to be aware of. We are monitoring for a chilly first weekend of fiesta and I want to enjoy it because these cold fronts are going to start kind of like going away and then the hot comes in before we know it so it's enjoy be this oh, those, dude, those I tips. love that yeah <laughs> that looks great there you mentioned taste of New Orleans oyster bake yeah. a lot of different things for the first weekend there should be a lot of fun good weather out there mm -hmm. all right thank you very much Sarah 948 right now and look at that getting closer to 70 degrees we're at 68 right now Coming up, the latest in your morning health news, including a big event happening today focused on a genetic condition that causes tumors to grow on nerves. Welcome back. It is now 9.52. Now to a big event aiming to provide big resources and big hope as well. The world's biggest summit focused on a genetic condition that causes tumors to grow on nerves is happening today. Yeah, the short name for the condition is NF and it affects one in every 2,000 people. 
All those patients are born with it, but some don't show symptoms until they are young adults. Courtney Friedman tells us more about the condition and what this summit in San Antonio means. At six months old, Krista Comfort was diagnosed with neurofibromatosis, or NF. It's a genetic tumor condition, but it's not cancer. It causes tumors to grow on the nerves throughout the body, and because they can grow anywhere, there can be a wide range of complications. Depending on where the tumors are, they can cause loss of vision and hearing, severe pain and mobility problems. Comfort has two tumors on her optic nerves, some on her spinal cord, and one in the skin on the left side of her neck. There has been little they've been, they've been able to do because it's so invasive in the skin that it would require years of surgery. The condition comes with a stigma. We're scared to ask you, you know, what's happened, and that's why I get involved, you know, in the summit. Comfort is a board member of the Children's Tumor Foundation's Texas chapter and is organizing the world's largest NF patient summit right here in San Antonio this Thursday through Saturday. You find out that you're not alone and that there's so many people like you you know, going through the same things. You get to connect with physicians, researchers, and there's so many great clinical trials going on that were a blip on the radar 10 years ago. In 2020, the FDA approved the very first drug to treat NF. We have now two drugs that are in phase three, which is the last phase before you go to the uh, to the approval. And there is a about 60-ish drugs now in the clinical pipeline. Children's Which Tumor Foundation president Annette Bacher started in cancer research and recognized the intersect with conditions like NF. Now she's trying to bridge the gap and find cancer treatments that could work for NF and vice versa. We are convinced that patients are partners in research. She includes patients in trial designs, which is why there are so many more participants than other rare disease trials. Now she just needs pharmaceutical companies and investors to jump on board. The research that's been being done today gives me so much hope that you know, if we can't find a cure, we'll at least be able to keep this condition stable in my lifetime. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, important information there from Courtney. Now to the CDC where it says it has found no link between COVID vaccines and cardiac deaths among young people. In this study, nearly 1,300 death certificates from people ages 16 to 30 years old were reviewed. Out of 101 death certificates where a cardiac event wasn't ruled out as a cause of death, 40 people received a COVID vaccine. Three of those people died within 100 days of vaccination. However, none of the death certificates listed vaccination as an immediate or contributing cause of death. And the cost is a main factor as to why a lot of women aren't getting regular mammograms. That's according to a new CDC study. It's estimated that routine mammograms can help reduce the rate of breast cancer deaths by more than 20%. But researchers found that women who could not afford the test were 20% less likely to get recommended mammograms. Other factors they found can involve social isolation, unemployment, lack of reliable transportation, and health care costs. Time now is 9.55, it is 68 degrees, we'll be right back.